Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're going to be tackling benign prosthetic hyperplasia, better known as BPH. Before we jump in, let's go through our practice question to kick things off. So a client with BPH is post-operative following a transurethral resection of the prostate. This is called a TERP. And they're now receiving continuous bladder irrigation. Upon assessment, the nurse notes that the output from the urinary catheter has stopped. So which nursing intervention is most appropriate? We have A, reinserting a new catheter, B, increasing the infusion rate of the irrigation, C, attempting to dislodge a clot, or D, contacting the healthcare provider. So let's go through exactly what BPH, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, actually is. It is basically the prostate's version of a midlife crisis. As men get older, the prostate gland starts to grow. And in BPH, the H for hyperplasia, it grows too much. So let's do a quick little anatomy tour here. The prostate is a small gland that sits right under the bladder and wraps around the urethra, the tube that carries the urine from the bladder out of the body, right? So when the prostate enlarges, think about where it is sitting, under the bladder, around the urethra. If it gets bigger and bigger, hyperplasia, it is going to squeeze the urethra, narrow the passageway that urine should go from bladder out the body, and that will make it harder for urine to flow. So to get a little more specific here, BPH develops in what we call the transition zone of the prostate, which directly surrounds that urethra. Hence, you know, putting that pressure in the can't pee. That's key because unlike in prostate cancer, which typically starts in the peripheral zone. So prostate cancer, peripheral zone, BPH, not cancerous, transition zone. The classic kind of like plumbing problems, slow stream, straining to pee, dribbling at the end of urination, that annoying feeling where it's like, I didn't empty my bladder all the way. These are all the obstructive symptoms that come with BPH. You can remember them with the acronym WISE, W, weak stream, I, intermittent flow, S, straining, and E, incomplete emptying, WISE. There is also another acronym. You can go with FUN for frequency, urgency, and nocturia. And really all of those things are because the bladder is working overtime to try and squeeze urine through that urethra that's being narrowed by the oversized prostate. And over time, that bladder muscle is getting irritated, leading to that constant need to go, the frequency, the urgency, even if there's really hardly any urine there. Now, most men over 70 do have some level of BPH. It's not cancerous, but it can seriously impact their quality of life. How do we treat it? It starts with an alpha blocker, most commonly tamulcillin. This helps relax the spoon muscles of the prostate, and it makes it way easier for the urine to pass. Because remember, that prostate getting bigger, it's pushing on that urethra, kind of, you know, blocking the roadway. So tamulcillin alpha blocker relaxes that muscle and opens up the road. Another option is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. This is something like finasteride. And that shrinks the prostate over time. But it does take longer to work because we have to get the prostate, you know, smaller enough to actually open up that best passageway. Now, if meds don't do the trick, that's where our surgical option comes into play, which is what we mentioned in our practice question, TERP, that transurethral resection of the prostate. You break that bound, basically transurethral, we're going up the ureter and we're resecting that prostate. We're basically scraping out the extra tissue from inside the prostate where it's hyperplastic and trying to therefore open up the urethra. And after surgery, we need to do that continuous bladder irrigation. That's going to flush out blood and clots. And that brings us right into our clinical case. We're going to talk today about an older gentleman. He came into a primary care facility I was doing a clinical rotation at. 
And he knew he had BPH. We didn't have to like diagnose it in this case, but medical therapy had failed. So he had already opted in to having a TERP. Now, I saw him on his follow-up after this whole story had played out, so I am giving you the history that was reported in the chart review that I did. Basically, his TERP surgery went, well, totally as expected. They went through the urethra, transurethra, and they excised that excessive prostate, that hyperplastic tissue, and got it where the urethra could be open enough. So he came back from the OR, he gets to the floor, and they have an indwelling catheter inserted that they inserted in the OR so that we could do some continuous bladder irrigation. And that is a key part of like typical post-op care from a TERP procedure. We are continuously putting saline into that bladder and taking it right back out through the indwelling catheter because we're basically trying to flush everything out. We want to prevent clots from being retained, reduce bladder spasms. There can be some blood from that spot where we've excised prostate tissue. So we want to keep everything flushed out and flowing. Now we're using sterile fluid. Usually it's normal saline that flows into the bladder and then drains out the urethra through that catheter. And it takes out any, you know, blood or clots along with it. So here is where for his case, things got interesting and I really want you guys to dial in. A few hours post-op per these notes, the nurse noticed there was fluid going in and nothing coming out. The drainage bag had no output in it. So that's a red flag right there. If we go back to the anatomy, remember that bed of the prostate, we've just excised tissues. It's raw. It's healing. If we have any clots or blood back up, it can block the tip of the catheter. Then we're putting fluid in, the bladder's getting distended because nothing else is coming out. And obviously that is going to be painful. It's going to put pressure on the surgical site. It's going to increase the bleeding. And I mean, a super extreme case, if we really filled up that bladder enough, it could rupture the bladder. So that is a key takeaway for CBI, continuous bladder irrigation. What goes in needs to come out. We're irrigating, not like trying to fill up that bladder like a balloon. So what do we do? All right. Do we immediately call the provider? Do we yank that catheter out? Put a new one in? No, 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 no. Yanking that out and putting a new one in could definitely damage the tissue. And there is an action here that you can do first to try and problem solve. This catheter might be kinked. There might be a clot stuck in there that is stopping the flow. That is really common post terp we know there's going to be clotting that's what we're trying to flush out so this nurse gently irrigated the catheter she dislodged a clot and whoosh we had a ton of output coming out that catheter big clot came out then we got fluid going and draining again that uh, gentleman who's telling us and we're reading the notes here he's like oh i was so uncomfortable and as soon as she got that clot out i immediately was back to normal my bladder felt fine again everything was good. And he was discharged normally. He had a really good recovery from his TERP procedure that was able to correct his BPH. And he no longer had the frequency, the urgency, the nocturia, all those other signs and symptoms of a large prostate squeezing his urethra. So he was much more comfortable. Again, we saw him on follow-up and no further medications were needed. He was good. He was cleared for normal activity. All right. So with that story in mind, let's loop it back to our practice question from the beginning of the episode and see now if you can get to the right answer and why. We've got our client with BPH and they just had that TERP. They're now receiving continuous bladder irrigation and on assessment, we don't see any output. So which intervention is most appropriate? We had A, reinserting a new catheter. B, increasing that infusion rate, C, attempting to dislodge a clot, or D, contacting the healthcare provider. All right, the correct answer, say it out loud, wherever you're at, what do you think? It is C, attempting to dislodge that clot. Remember, after your TERP, we're using that continuous bladder irrigation to keep clots from building out. We're flushing up blood, we're flushing out all the bad stuff. So if output stops, 
we need to think what is blocking it. There could be a kink in the catheter. They could be a clot blocking it up. So your priority is to problem solve and get that urine flowing again. We're going to gently irrigate or try to aspirate through an outflow port to get things moving again. All right. Reinserting a new catheter. Oof, that is a possibility. We might have to do it eventually, but it's not going to be our first intervention because we just had a surgical procedure, pulling a catheter out, putting a new one in, that can cause trauma to the tissue. So least invasive first, and that is trying to dislodge the clot. Why is D calling the healthcare provider not the correct answer? Well, because when we're taking these exam questions, if there is something we can do as the nurse then we are going to do it, all right? We see that we can try to dislodge the clot. That can help solve our problem. That least invasive option is going to come first before calling the healthcare provider. When you're answering these questions and contacting the healthcare provider is an option, I want you to be hesitant to choose that. First, look at your other answers and say, will any of these address the problem? For here, we had a chirp. We had a catheter that wasn't getting output. The problem was a clot. We could address that by attempting to dislodge the clot. If there was no answer that could address this client's problem and they're just going to keep getting worse, then it's appropriate to contact the healthcare provider. So that's a little test taking tip for you today. So wrapping it up here, remember the key takeaways with BPH. We've got this prostate that's enlarged and it is blocking urine flow. There's a couple of medical options, but if they don't work surgically, our last resort is that TERP procedure. And post-op from a TERP, one of our big interventions is that bladder irrigation. Priority nursing action for you is to make sure that urine is flowing. Irrigation that goes in needs to come out. And if it doesn't, you need to assess and try to get that clot out, restore the flow, relieve that pressure so we don't have bigger and bigger problems. And remember, you'll always start with the least invasive step first. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time. 